Hey, hey, Energizer. Welcome to another episode of the Jones and Four show. And, you know, you are in for a treat. Uh, we have these amazing interviews here on the show, as you know, bringing you amazing people to help you live your life to the max. Everything from gut health to mental toughness and everything in between. And today we're, we're, we're focusing on the latter, that mental toughness. We want to help you be tough mentally so that you are able to persevere through the hard days, those struggling days, and really enjoy and embrace those incredible, amazing days that we all have, right? And um, I was talking with our guest right before this and saying that, you know, we all struggle with days. Some days are great. Some days are awesome and beautiful. And other days, whether it's inside or out, we don't have those beautiful, amazing days. We should, we're struggling and it's okay. We all have them. We all persevere and all those beautiful days are still there for us, we could still find them. We just need to have that mental toughness to get through that. So as you guessed, mental toughness is a topic and our amazing guest joining us today without any further ado is Shawnee Harley. Welcome to the Jones and Four show. Thank you for being here. Bam, let's go. <laughs> well, let's, uh, you know, our listeners are new to you. I've just met you a couple weeks ago and started to get to know you more and more, love everything you are about. So share a little bit about you and yourself and your journey with uh, our Jones and Four Energizers. Let's give me, see if I can do the, the Coles Notes version here. <laughs> uh, I was an athlete. I use that term loosely. I think lots of us like to call ourselves athletes, uh, but I participated in sport my whole life. And uh, eventually my sporting days ended at the, um, the college level after three years. And it was actually really good. I got cut because I wasn't good enough. And it really ticked me off at the time. But um, it pushed me to where I actually needed to go, which was into coaching. And I was a a uh, full-time college coach for 18 years. No, sorry, 20 years. 20? Holy cows. Yes, 20. Right. And where I ended up, so now I'm, I'm a mental toughness coach. I do consulting, uh, corporate consulting and that kind of thing. How did I get there was I was at the, in, when I was still a, a coach, I was with Team Canada at the 2016 Olympics in Rio as an assistant coach with our women's, our Canadian women's national basketball team. And what, what got me into mental toughness was we had, we had had the most unbelievable run leading up to the Olympics, like the 18 months prior, we had done more winning than our national team had ever done. Holy and God. we were rocking it and we got to the Olympics and we were on a, the highest of highs, you know, sport, the thrill of victory, right? And the agony of defeat. And I was living the thrill of victory. And I still remember standing in front of our flag on our opening game at the Olympics and the anthem started playing. Oh my gosh, I can feel that still. Hmm. Uh, the anthem the anthem started playing and I got so emotional because I was like, I, oh my goodness, like I did it. We did it. I'm here. We're here. It was just, uh, just, it gives me uh, shivers still. And I learned so many important lessons at the Olympics because Sport always deals us two things, happy and crappy. <laughs> so we sometimes get the thrill of victory and often we get the agony of defeat. And so I had that thrill, those thrill of victory moments. And then probably 10 days later, um, we, were, we went through the, our pool play, we just playing some really great basketball, got all the way to the quarterfinals. Do you know how big that is? Like it's huge. If you huge. win the quarterfinal game, you're playing for a medal. Like, come on, people, a medal. And long story short, we did not win our quarterfinal game. We were the favorite oh. playing against an opponent, a known opponent that we had already beaten three or four times previously. And what I have to come to terms with, and I have to speak the truth about, is that on the biggest day, the biggest stage of my life, I choked. I underperformed. 
and I lived the agony of defeat. We all underperformed, our team, all of us. And I just, I, those were my darkest days. And after I got out of the darkness, I just knew what I needed to do next. What I needed to do next was help people build a toolkit so that on the biggest day, the biggest stage of their life, their best self shows up because mine didn't. That's, that's an incredible story. And not just a story, but thing to live through. And I, I remember hearing about it, right? So I live in Wisconsin and I heard about Canada being there and make it to the quarterfinals, being the favorite and that, that whole story, right? I was following it along and hearing that you didn't make it through to the quarterfinals. I know I was like, seriously, like, oh my God, that's crazy. And I can't imagine being on the team and being one of those coaches and feeling that. And then I could totally understand within reason, I've never been on a stage that large before, but I can imagine how devastating that would be and how that would send you spiraling into those dark days. And we, we all have different, you know, different moments in our life, different times in our life that, that hit us hard, that beat us down and, and put us into those dark places. And many of us stay there. Many of us struggle and we get stuck there and we don't know how to get out. But what I love is that you took that moment those dark days and you said you know what this sucks I'm here and sure you you stayed there for a little bit but then you said I'm gonna get out and then when I get out of this I'm gonna help people to not go through the same thing so that they could be better they could be their best self uh, when on their biggest day or on the majority of days whatever that is right that they could be putting their best self forward so first of all I applaud you for that that is absolutely incredible wow 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 um how was it the whole Olympic experience as a whole, how was it for you? I know I, I get emotional again when I, I, it's, I think that when you grow up doing something that you love, and I can remember writing in my high school yearbook, because I played basketball in high school, I remember hiding, hide, writing in my yearbook that I wanted to go to the Olympics. And obviously at that time, I was thinking of it as an athlete. And then like, I can't remember how long after that would have been when I got there. And I'm like, man, I wrote this in my high school yearbook. And, and now I'm here. And it was like being at the Olympics for me was kind of like being at a buffet. It was like, I was at the most amazing buffet of my favorite food, which is sport. And the, the cultures that get to mingle and watching other sports and hearing other athlete stories and watching the struggles. Most people at the Olympics struggle. Most people at the Olympics go home disappointed. Right. So I, you know, I just got to experience this, this thing that I had dreamt about for my whole life. And I got to experience it. And even though the disappointment was real, the darkness was real, um, on that in that quarterfinal, I was very clear that there was I was going there for more than just that. And every day I would wake up and when I got all my work done, watching video, doing the scout re scouting report, whatever I needed to do, I'm like, okay, I'm going for an adventure just to experience this Olympics because I'm like, I will probably never be here again. I don't want to leave any stone unturned. So my Olympic experience from that aspect still gives me chills. I, I can imagine that. I love that you embrace that moment and you left no stone unturned, right? You, you embraced it with as much love and as much acceptance as possible and saw and I tried these different things and, and were just receptive to the amazing and amazement and loving energy and all of that that the Olympics are. And that, you know, you, you kept doing your best push to win and the mindset uh, of winning. And obviously dealing with, you're right, the majority of people who go to the Olympics, the majority of them don't make it. They don't medal, right? And it's not just a gold medal, even that's a slimmer percentage, but just medal in general, the majority of people don't. And and in life, right, we might not be Olympians. I'm, I'm not an Olympian by any means, but, you know, I go through life and there's days where I feel like I could get a gold medal and there's other days I bronze or silver or no medal. And those days are sometimes really tough or we celebrate. 
So how, how do you help people get through these tough days for them to show them their best self on those days that really matter? Well, again, I, I feel like I'm still learning, you know, myself. I, I've learned so much from the clients that I work with and listening to their stories. And, you know, I, there was such great learning for me when I actually had the courage to go and truly self-reflect. Because when bad things are happening or we don't get what we want or life's not going well or we're having the cloudy days, I know for myself, I don't feel like I was a very good self-reflector. And I think part of that is uh, sport teaches us not to look at our negative emotions, right? It just says, you know, just go out there and be confident, fake it till you make it, right? So it teaches us really not to be emotionally intelligent. It teaches us the opposite. So I didn't think, I don't think I was very good at it. And then when I got into this dark hole, mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, I, I, I have to do this differently than I've done before. And once I got, was able to see the light, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do a deep dive. I'm going to go and I'm going to ask myself, what didn't I see? And then I'll tell you what, there was a bigger question Mm -hmm. that haunted me. And I'm like, Ooh, that's a good question. So I asked myself two questions. What didn't I see? And then the second question was, what did I see, but refused to look at? And that, that, yes, like Spencer, that smacked me right upside the head. Cause I'm like, okay, now I know the work that I need to do to come out of this darkness, because I believe that when things aren't going well for us, whatever words, and that's that's totally normal, by the way, whatever words we choose for it, what I have gotten better at and what I teach my clients is what's in the way is the way. So we must go through it, not around it, not under it, not over it, not blow it up with a stick of dynamite. We must go through it because that's where the learning is. That if we have a growth mindset and we have the courage and the humility to go back and look and take a good hard look in the mirror and say, okay, Shawnee, let's have a look. That is not easy, but I think, I think that's what helped me build this business. That's what helped me come out of the darkness. And so what I speak to with my clients and myself, like I better dang well be doing whatever it is I'm teaching my clients or I'm not a very good coach. Right. So what I work on is I call it, I do heart work. Why heart work? Because that's where the truth is. And the truth shall set you free. And I believe to come out of the dark days, we have to be willing to look inside and speak the truth. That is absolutely incredible. I'm, just, I'm writing this down so I, I can remember it and, and follow it with a question. But it, Holy cow, like you hit me with a ton of bricks there because I preach self-reflection, you know, look at, you know, reflect back on what you've done or different things, your emotions, your thoughts, and look at it to see, okay, what did I experience and all all that? And, you know, what did I miss in that time? What did I not notice at the time? Because afterwards you can usually, you know, you look back with 2020 vision a lot of the time, not all the time, but you look back and you say, oh, this is what I missed. Here's that. But I love what you said. This is what hit me hard was that fact that I saw this but I did not want to deal with it at that time, or I did not use it. I didn't want to embrace it. I didn't want to, I saw it, but I ignored it. And how many times in our life has, have we done that? And that has been the thing that has knocked us down, that hurt us more than anything, or didn't, and did not help us grow is the fact that we saw it, but we, we refused to deal with it. Huge. That is so well said. I, I remember after I got out of the hole um, that I was in from coming home from the Olympics, 
I can remember coming up with these questions and I still, I use them with my clients because I think, I think they help us get to the truth Hmm. because I don't think I, I don't, until we speak the truth, we're just lying to ourselves. Well, how's, how's that going to help us? So these are the questions that help, I think, get to the truth. What am I afraid of? What am I avoiding? What am I protecting? And what am I protecting against? They're, they're sort of similar questions, but with little nuances with each, each question. And I know when I ask myself those four questions, there's no wiggle room. There's no wiggle room for me to, to hide from the truth. Those really help me get to the truth. And they also seem to help my clients get to the truth. And remember I said the truth will set us free, mm-hmm. but there's, no, there's nothing free. I mean, there, there's nothing right. free. But the freedom comes for me and for my clients where the freedom comes in comes is okay now i'm solving the right problem because we work really hard a lot of times with great intentions but we're not solving the right problem because we haven't drilled down deep enough to look at the root of what's going on what's driving our behavior and so Man, when we can just dig in there and we start solving the right problem, take the right actions, be intentional, now now we can move. Now we can shift. Holy cow. Uh, Just, I mean, you're dropping these incredible bombs here for us. And I... I'm in awe and I thank you for the fact that how many times do we go through life and when we try to work through a problem or try to do something better, right? Or or we want to focus on this emotion. We think that that's the right thing or what society tells us to do, but that's not the right problem to be addressing, right? We just go for the most obvious one or the one we think that it might be, but we don't drill down enough to know. So now we're just wasting our time, wasting our energy on something that It might be beneficial, maybe, but most likely it's not. We need to drill down and get the the root, as you said, I love that, the root problem. And asking yourself these four questions, what am I afraid of? What am I avoiding? What am I protecting? And what am I protecting against? Oh, I love that last one. Because now there are nuances, but there's the nuances that narrow it down into, into the thing, that problem that you actually need to face. And, you know, I'm I'm doing this myself right now as, as you ask those questions and I'm thinking about this and I can't go as deep as I want because right, we're doing the interview, but I'm thinking about this going, ouch, ouch, there's, there's some truth there that I need to, to work through, to process, to sit with, to be with, and not just avoid, right? Not just avoid it, but sit with it. Holy cow. So after we ask ourselves these questions, what, what do we do? We, we figure out what the problem is or we have a better idea of it. What do we do then? You know, I, I don't have all the answers. I, I can only tell you what works for me and, and then what I teach my clients and it seems to work for them as well. I, I think that drilling down and asking ourselves those questions, it helps us solve the right problem. And I mentioned that already. And it's like, okay, good. Well, we're solving the right problem. Hallelujah. Finally, we're, we know what we're supposed to be doing. And so what that shows me is we have gone from what to why. So in other words, this this is what I feel. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm thinking to why. Why am I thinking this? What's going on with me right now? Because it's really difficult to change behavior by addressing the behavior. We only change behavior by understanding what's driving the behavior and to me that that's the why why am i doing this why am i thinking this and what i work on with um i'll give you some examples from the client work that i do and right now i'm working with a big group of athletes in a program that's called fear to fierce when they come in first to my program they don't even know they They cannot accurately identify their fear because sport has told them 
Oh, no, no, no. That's We don't have that emotion here. Fake it till you make it. Just pound your chest, get out there and be confident. So they are not, they're not solving the right problem. They're trying to go out and be confident, which is lying to yourself. How are you supposed to be confident when you're not confident? Oh, fake it till you make it. Right. Well, that doesn't work long term. So we get in and we speak truth and we talk about the truth and I help them identify the fear and the root of it. And we all have it. It's completely normal. They're called feelings because we're supposed to feel them. Mm-hmm. And, and I then say, let's go in and be a detective, bring in the FBI because feelings bring information. So we're, we're being a detective looking for clues. What are these feelings showing me? Because when our heart speaks, we better listen. If we ever want to show up as our best self on the biggest day, the biggest stage of our life, and we haven't listened to our hearts, we haven't spoken truth. Well, you can see how that's going to not work very well. So we go in, I go in there and I help them identify the root of the fear. And I will tell you, so I work with athletes and their parents, and it is so interesting when I watch these patterns, there are no unique, there are, there are no unique problems. Hmm. There are, the problems are not infinite. Interesting. There's finite set of problems. And with, with athletes and their parents, one of the biggest things that holds them back, and again, they are not able to identify this until we have to do some drilling. They'll be, so I'll be like, okay, what, I'll take you through. So I'll be like, okay, what are you afraid of? And they're like, let's just use basketball because that's my sport that I know so well. They'll be like, oh, I'm afraid of missing a shot. And I'm like, no, you're not. And they're like, yes, I am. I'm like, no, you're not. I said, give me another example. Be like, I'm afraid of making a mistake. I'm like, no, you're not. They're like, yes, I am. You can see where this is going. So they tell me all of these things that they're afraid of. And so then I say to them, okay, well, let's, because that's the behavior. I'm afraid of missing a shot, afraid of making a mistake. I'm like, well, let's go deeper. So then I say to them, when you miss a shot, when you make a mistake, what's the biggest feeling that arises. And again, sport does not. And so most of them, I'm on a Zoom call with them and they're looking at me in the camera and they're like, what does she mean? I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> we're going to talk about the F words. Right. We're going to talk about fear and we're going to talk about feelings, the F words. Yes. So then I say to them, when those things happen, you miss a shot, you make a mistake. What's the biggest feeling that comes up? So I have to help them even name a feeling. And the number one feeling that comes up is embarrassment. Mm. So then I'm like, then I'm like, okay, there's another level. We have to drill deeper. Where does embarrassment come from? What is the root of embarrassment? Why do five-year-olds not feel embarrassed? So for me, what I teach is, embarrassment comes from the fear of disapproval because if I made a mistake and everybody clapped and cheered and gave me ten dollars and social media told me how amazing I was would I feel embarrassed about the mistake no No. so we get stuck in I I, it's not my phrase but fopo kind of like FOMO fear of people's opinions interesting and the parents are stuck in the exact same thing so they'll say to me oh my kid's not doing xyz and i'm like so like i'm like well what's wrong with that well and i'm not i'm like well then how does it make you feel and what they what i help them see is they're worried about what other people are thinking about their kids. So it's keep up with the Joneses in sport. It's like, well, what if, what if they don't get chosen for the team? What if they're not on the starting lineup? So this is how I help them work through it. Number one, we identify the fear because we need to solve the right problem. And they always give me a behavior 
-hmm. which is not the problem. And then we drill down until we can identify the fear. And the number one thing with the clients that I work with, there are others, but the number one is the fear of disapproval. What will my coach think? What will my teammates think? What will social, social media think? Right. And so we play scared and then, and so we hide, we play it safe. So when we're afraid of making a mistake, what do we do? We play it safe. Right. Because we don't want to look bad. We, we protect against looking bad. We protect against embarrassment. And what I find so fascinating about that in sport, but I think it's everywhere. When we protect against those things, it hinders our growth. It does because we're playing it safe, right? We're, we're not allowing ourselves to be our full, authentic, real self, however you want to describe it. Uh, we're, we're not allowing ourselves to do that. And I, I see it in sports, right? I was a middle school, high school choir director for nine years. I saw it with my kids who played sports. I saw it with kids who I directed when they were on stage in productions. You know, they have that fear of failing on stage or forgetting their lines and, and all that fear, right? It's that problem, but it's not that feeling. And we have to boil it down to the feeling. And the thing that I'm super fired up if you haven't figured that out already, because holy cow, this is, this is a problem. And it's not a problem just in sports and with kids, but with adults and with everyone, because especially in today's society, generally, um, I, would, I would assume Western culture, I don't know about Eastern cultures totally, but I'm going to just assume that the majority of people, we are told to stuff down those emotions that we don't feel, that we shouldn't be feeling those emotions, especially as as guys, but women as well, we have to stuff down these feelings. Oh, we can't have this. Now, is there a time and place for those feelings? Yes. And sometimes, you know, you can't be breaking down at, you know, if you're on stage giving a talk necessarily, unless it fits, but you know, like we have to be able to look at those feelings and it's okay. It's okay to, to look at your feelings, to go through them, to see what we are afraid of and what we need to do to be our best selves. And a lot of the time is, we need to face those fears and those fears and those feelings and embrace them with love so that we can, we can move beyond it and use them and have them so we can be our best, full, true, real self. Hey, sorry to butt in like this, but I have something really cool I wanna share with you, something that I know, I know it can help you live your life to the max. What am I talking about? I'm talking about a roadmap, a roadmap that gets you to your destination. What do roadmaps do, right? Well, you have your destination. It shows you how to get there, the best way to get to that point. And you know what? That's what I have. What is this roadmap I'm talking about? I'm talking about my book, Chase Your Passion. That's right. You have a passion. You have a destination. You have goals, dreams you want to achieve. But maybe you're confused on how to get there. Maybe you're feeling stuck. Well, my book, Chase Your Passions, is that roadmap. It guides you through how to create that plan, how to create that roadmap, how to get over hurdles so you can have success. So if you're ready to ditch the excuses, if you're ready to get unstuck and ready to have success, to taste success and feel amazing, to achieve your goals and dreams, get your copy of Chase Your Passions. It's available on Amazon or just head to my website, spencermjones.com. All right, let's catch y'all later and let's keep chasing our passions. Let's go. I, I completely agree. And what I find this, this wording has helped the clients that I use, that I work with, you know, I'll give you an example. I work with a professional golfer on the LPGA tour. Mm -hmm. And so I, she'll be like, she'll be like Shawnee, like I stand over a three foot putt and I feel like I want to puke. I'm like, Oh, I know that's the puke zone in golf. Mm -hmm. And so we drill in there about what, he, what she's afraid of. And what she says is, I'm a professional golfer. I'm not supposed to miss those putts. But you can see, I'm like, well, who told you that? Right. Where do, is that written in your contract? But you can see it, the, that we're coming down again to what, what will other people think when I miss the putt? So what happens when we are in this fear and we haven't identified it and we haven't paid attention to it, 
We don't know what to do with it. We get caught on either end of a scale. On one end is striving. So she'll be standing over that putt, trying hard to make it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, she's also resisting, trying hard not to miss it. And you can see when we want to do anything in life for our best self to show up, when we're in striving or resisting, where it's too much, it's too much wanting, it's too much fear, you can see we get, it freezes us and we, we underperform. And so what I try to help my clients get to is there's a sweet spot in the middle of that scale. And I use two words. I call it accept and allow. So the opposite of striving and resisting is accepting slash allowing. And one of the things that I'm noticing with myself and with my clients, we do not like to look at our feelings truthfully because where we go with it is self-judgment. Why should I shouldn't be afraid of a three foot putt? I'm a professional golfer. You know, I don't know why I don't feel happy today. It's a, it's a beautiful sunny day out there. Like what's wrong with me? Right? So as soon as we start going inside to figure it out, we immediately go to self-judgment. Well, that feels shitty. I don't know a nice way to say it. So who wants to do that? Right. No one wants to do that. So then we don't do it. So what I help my clients do is to normalize feelings. I think all feelings are normal. They are not in two buckets. Here's the happy ones. Here's the unhappy ones. Only have happy. I'm like, oh, no. They're all one bucket. Society, sport, work teaches us to put judgment. This feeling is better than this one. Mm -hmm. Have this, don't have that. Well, I, I just don't, I just don't think that works. And if we can say, I can stand over a three foot putt and say, you know what? I feel like peeing my pants right now. To me there, that's an acceptance. And I didn't say you had to like it. Accepting it doesn't mean you have to like it. It's the ability. I think mental toughness, one of the pieces of mental toughness is the ability to tolerate uncomfortable feelings and emotions. When we tolerate them, it means we're not running away from them. We're not avoiding them. We're not striving. We're not resisting. We're tolerating. I've also learned that tolerance is like a muscle. And it grows when you use it. You get better at tolerating these negative emotions and they don't feel so shitty after a while. It's like, oh, felt that one before. Oh, yeah, been there before. Oh, yeah, mm, blah, blah, blah. And so as an example, what this golfer has learned, when she's in striving or resisting, her anxiety on a scale of one to 10 is a nine. When I can help her tolerate accept whatever words we want to use. You might miss it. You might make it. Sport's a gamble. Right. That means the outcome is not guaranteed. When I can get her into this allowing and this accepting, her anxiety, this is what I love about it. It doesn't go away. We're not trying to make it go away. We're trying to manage it. She, she'll tell me, she goes, Shawnee, when I practice this, I, my anxiety goes from a nine to a six. And she says, when it's a six, I'll make most of those putts. Notice she didn't say, oh, yeah, Shawnee, this is like just a magic formula. I do this and my anxiety just completely goes away. No, it doesn't. Anxiety is normal in, in the way that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about, you know, a, mental, a real big mental health issue where we have therapy and right. we have medication. I'm not talking about it at that level. I'm just talking about it. Lots of people say they have nerves and anxiety and unsettledness in their life. And in sport, it's very, very common. And so I help athletes accept themselves. So they stop striving, they stop resisting, and they start allowing 
and tolerating. I think that's what emotional intelligence is. Part I, would, I would agree. Uh, and I love that, that you're helping people who are in sports do this to accept and allow those feelings to come in. And I really, truly love and appreciate the fact that you said it doesn't, it does not make the anxiety go away. It doesn't just totally obliterate it, that it blows up. No, it's, it's lowering it. It's managing it so that it comes to a manageable point. If it's at a nine, well, that's really freaking hard to manage. But at a six, okay, we can breathe. We're not happy or comfortable. We can still manage and focus enough to do what we need to do. And that's so much of it. And you're right. We're not talking about the medical anxiety. We're talking about, okay, I have this presentation to do. Oh, I have to make this putt. Oh, I have to make this shot. I have to do whatever it is, whether it's in sports or life right? Your regular life, your work life, your home life, whatever, your passions, we get nervous, right? Like I remember I love kayak fishing. I'm out there in a tournament having fun, but I'm putting all this pressure on myself and get anxiety about, oh, am I going to catch this fish at this time or what I need to do, right? And I need to boil that down into those feelings, which I didn't do at the time because I didn't realize this. But if we could do that, we can allow and accept it, then we can normalize those feelings and we can be like, oh, it's okay. It's we're, we're getting used to it. It's not getting rid of it. It's not obliterating it, but it's saying, hey, we can tolerate it and we can work through these and to keep working through it and build up that tolerance, that uh, ability so that it's not totally high anxiety and, and, and stopping us or, or stopping us dead in our tracks, right? Freezing us. We're still able to go through and be at our best self when that pressure is on because we all go through pressure in life and we have to learn how to deal with that. Well, what if we even termed it or phrased it in a way like pressure is a privilege? You know, what if we phrased it as, oh, no wonder I feel anxious. This matters to me. Right. Like if you didn't give a crap. You wouldn't be nervous. You wouldn't be right? nervous. You wouldn't have to feel that yeah. pressure because it doesn't matter. Right. And so that's why I don't try to talk my clients out of the feeling. I'm like, wow, this must be, this must be important to you. If for some way, shape or form, this matters to you in your life. Well, how cool is that? Okay. So, so again, we, we're try we try, I help them build a different relationship with negative emotions. We normalize them. We, we say, okay, let's get a toolkit to manage them. What are my negative emotions telling me? When I think that when we do that, what I'm telling, I come on my clients, and I'm like, okay, so number, they all come on. Shoni, I want you to help me stop feeling nervous. I'm like, oh no, don't hire me for that. No, I'm not, <laughs> don't hire me. I'm not the right person for you. No, this is all normal. I'm not going to tell you to stop feeling X. You're a human being first, a human doing second. So go ahead and feel, and then let's figure out what to do with how you feel. I, I love that. Um, I, it takes me back to when I was in college. Um, I was music ed major, piano was my instrument. And uh, my professor, my piano professor told me anytime any of us, any of our piano folks got up there to perform on stage, we were backstage and he was usually back there just talking with us, trying to keep us calm. And we always would say, oh, we're so nervous to go, right? We're nervous to be up on stage and the nerves are up there, butterflies are happening. And he says, well, it's good. It's a good thing if you're nervous because that means it matters to you and that you care. Same thing with anxiety, right? There's, there's something on the line, whatever it is, whether it's what fear that is or feeling is, but you have something there and that is a privilege. I love, love, love that viewpoint of, it's a privilege to have those things because if we didn't care, if it didn't matter to us, man, life would be really boring. Life would be really empty if we didn't have those things that gave us that pressure, that, that made us nervous, but also excited. Life would be really boring. And so it is a true privilege to have those in our life. I, I love that viewpoint. Thank you. If I could add another uh, piece on this that has really also made a difference for me and my clients I, I took the concept from Brene Brown and, you know, the famous speaker and author, and she talks about brave and afraid. And so I say to the athletes that I work with, it's possible to be brave and afraid at the same time. 
Hmm. We can hold these two things simultaneously because afraid is, emo is an emotion and brave is an action. I can choose to take action bravely, courageously, even when I feel afraid. And so what I work on, how do, we, how do I combat all of these feelings that are going on? So what do we do with it? I say to the athletes, when you go out, what would you do right now if you weren't afraid? What yeah. would you say right now if you weren't afraid? The minute you step onto the court, if you weren't afraid, what would you do? So when I say to these hockey players, when you're playing with your friends out on the rink in the backyard, what do you do? And they're like, oh, it's so, and I'm like, I know because there's no pressure. There's nobody watching. There's no scouts. And so they understand what it feels like to play free. I call it playing freely. Mm -hmm. So I work on with them. We're not trying to get rid of the fear or the anxiety or the nerves. It's completely normal. It's because it matters. Can you be brave and afraid? Can you choose courage? Because they all want me to give them confidence. I'm like, oh, don't hire me for that. Nope, I'm not your confidence coach. Because confidence is an emotion based on results. If you're crappy at something, you, you shouldn't be confident. Hello? <laughs> right? Right? Confidence and competence are related. So I say to them, if you wait to do that, try your new move in a game until you feel confident, you're going to wait a really, 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 really long time. How about courage? How about choose courage? Because courage is actually a choice. It's a decision. And we're going to feel unconfident. We're going to feel nervous, anxious, afraid, scared, self-doubt. And if we let those emotions drive our behavior, we don't move forward. Feel those emotions and choose courage. And I tell them, you know how much courage you need? This much, one degree. Mm -hmm. Because we're in Celsius in Canada, and here's the analogy. At 99 degrees, water's extremely hot. At 100 degrees, water boils. With boiling water comes steam. Steam can power a locomotive. One degree makes all the difference. And I asked them, can you show up tomorrow at this thing that really matters to you with one degree of courage? And then they say, yes. And I'm like, what will your proof and evidence be? Give me one thing that you're going to do that is proof and evidence of courage. And then tell me, and then I get them to follow up with me at the end. Right. So that, that's how we kind of work through this process. And it's not easy. If this stuff was, this is simple, but it's not easy. If it was easy, everyone would be rocking it. This is hard. Right. The good stuff takes work, right? I mean, it's, it's nice and dandy you know, to have a magic pill, but let's be honest that the quick fixes aren't really out there. And those that are, aren't worth it because the good things in life, they take work, they take effort. So if you want to have that mental toughness in life, you need to put in that work, deal with those emotions, put in that time, the effort, and then that result, the payoff is incredible because you put in that time, that work, and you get to reap the rewards from it. I love it. This has been absolutely phenomenal. Holy cow. My, I mean, so many amazing truth bombs here, amazing moments, mic drop moments, whatever you want to call them, because I, I can't wait. I'm going to listen to this one again and again and again for myself. And oh my gosh, how can people learn more about you, work with you uh, if, if it fits and aligns? How can, how can they connect? Well, my website is a really good place to find me and it's shawneeharley.com. Perfect. Do I need to spell that or you do have it in show notes or how do you? Great question. Um, I, it will be in our show notes. So yeah, Perfect. folks, go to spencermjones.com slash Jones and Four Show and uh, find this episode and you'll get the show notes, everything written out here as well from this interview. So you can see it, remind yourself of it and 
get the link to her website as well. Are you on and social I'll also, media? I'll also I'm on social, I'm trying to get better at social media. Uh, <laughs> there are some things I'm good at. There are other things I'm not as good at, but social media, my Facebook page is Shawnee Harley. You get a taste of what I teach. I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, and I'm also on LinkedIn. Perfect. Oh my gosh. This was amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, your energy, your knowledge and expertise. Thank you. It means the world to me. I appreciate it. How fun was that? Whew, man, so many amazing things. Uh, energizers, you need to check out Shawnee. Like, holy cow, if this was a taste of the stuff she gives, I mean, this is you need to work with her. I mean, amazing. I, I need to see how I can work with her now to make this stuff happen, to work through my feelings so I can be at my best when it's needed and all the time in life. So do yourself a favor, check out her website, connect with her on social media, and you know, don't forget to subscribe to this episode or to our show so you don't miss a single episode. And until next time, keep being awesome. Remember, you matter, you rock, and you are enough just the way you are. So until next time, I'll catch y'all later.